Thank you very much, Christian. Um, once again, thanks to the Global Donor Platform for uh, giving us the opportunity today to present uh, part of our work from last year, which um, Steve and his team from ODI carried out. We would like to start with our presentation titled Agriculture Policy for Development, a Contemporary Agenda. These are some of the main messages we're going to talk about in a minute from a background paper that Steve uh, and uh, some other people from ODI uh, wrote for us um, within the last six months. So I will just briefly give uh, one slide of introduction uh, titled What Did We Do and Why? and um, to set a bit the scene where we were coming from. Uh, we actually came back from uh, the whole discussion Revival of Agricultural Development and Rural Poverty Reduction. In, uh, we detected, or we, we had the strong uh, feedback also from within GIZ, from colleagues working in the field, um, mainly in Africa, but also in other parts of the world, that agricultural topics are more uh, up to date again, not only in these developed countries, but as well uh, in developing countries and like BRICS and the larger developing countries, and that, for example, neighboring low-income developing countries are looking up to the champions of the region, let's say um, Brazil, for example, in Latin America, the neighboring countries look up to them and discover that they have quite um, an active modern agriculture policy where the government engages in a lot of um, new policies. And then, of course, we know from the past six years that um, we all know since the food price crisis, the entire de um, debate about food price volatility and the message that we must be prepared that high food prices and volatile food prices are here to stay with us. Um, we observe at the same time the agricultural market boom in terms of natural resources. Um, the whole question about land use and land grabs and investments in land, whatever you might to call it, and so on and so forth. So I think um, what, from an agency's point of view, within GI, that um, there was um, a discussion about we should reconsider our take on agricultural policy advisory services. The agriculture world and the agriculture policy world have changed during the last six years. We know that now. But now, what does that mean for us? Um, so the following question, questions came up for us. Uh, so what would constitute a contemporary agenda of agricultural development policy? Um, what would staff of GIZ and other agencies, what would such a contemporary advisor on agriculture policy would need to know? And um, do they have the skills actually to do the job properly at the moment? So with this type of questions, we um, talked to Steve and found that OEI would be a perfect partner in analyzing um, the state of the art and um, based on ODI's wide-ranging experience and work in the area, and particularly Steve's experience, um, I'll hand over to you, and Steve is going to present us what um, they think about these questions. Thank you. OK, thanks, thanks, Heike. In 15 minutes, this is an attempt to put a particular line of argument about what we have in a document which, of course, is much longer and ranges over a much wider set of issues. So to get us started, the starting point that, that I'm using here is that starting point that says many people get despondent about agriculture as being the awkward sector, the difficult, the difficult sector. And on various occasions, we've pondered why is it that agriculture has this reputation of not being the easy area to work in. And our answer says something, something like this. Look, the first, the, the, the first part of this is that agriculture usually in low-income countries, and I am talking primarily here about low-income countries rather than middle-income countries, is a sector which is expected to achieve a great deal. It's got general economic development functions because it's a large part of the economy in terms of its ability to contribute to growth, the number of people that work in it, and its contribution to trade. So there's an agenda there about growth, employment, and exports. 
because the majority of people working in, in rural areas are engaged with agriculture, but this is usually in low-income countries where the majority of people who are poor, food insecure, malnourished exist, there is a big set of aims there that if we're going to reduce poverty and hunger, agriculture will be, won't be the only part, but it will be an important part of the story. Again, because agriculture is often spatially and socially um, so important, all of those objectives of equity that we have in development, they are reflected onto the agricultural scratch pad. So we're expected to achieve social equity, we're expected to, achieve, to get uh, equity between the sexes, and we're expected to deal with regional equity and try and bring along those regions which are, are often lagging compared to the more advanced regions within countries. And last but not least, agriculture is, of course, completely dependent on, on natural resources. And so all of those parts of the environmental agenda that respond to natural resource management and making our farming compatible with a changing climate, adapting to that changing climate, and mitigating the forces of climate change, those are also on our agenda. So it's an unusually wide agenda. Uh, if you were dealing with health or education, I don't think you'd be expected to hit so many objectives at any one time. So it's very easy for people to, to, to look at any agricultural strategy and say, I don't think very much of that because it doesn't contribute to this or that objective. And so we are, we, we are given, we are entrusted with this very wide set of objectives. The second thing we can say that makes agriculture awkward is, of course, this is not pure public spending. Most of the actors in, in, in agriculture are private, be they farmers or people in the agribusiness supply chains. And, of course, all that government can do is set conditions, incentives, support. It can't actually direct what goes on in agriculture. And last but not least, politically and administratively in many countries, uh, agricultural policy making and general support to agricultural policy is not particularly well focused. Political support, surprisingly, I'm not a political scientist, so I shan't comment on why that's the case at the moment, despite the majority of voters living in rural areas in most low-income countries, political support to agriculture is often rather weak uh, dispersed and, and you know, just not brought together in the way that you might think. And the public agencies which deal with agriculture, responsibilities are often quite fragmented. Yes, we've got a Ministry of Agriculture, but very often we've got other ministries such as water development, sometimes irrigation, sometimes livestock. And then, of course, a whole series of agencies which are very important for agriculture, such as whichever ministry handles the roads, will be a separate entity. So we don't necessarily have things well joined up to get coherent approaches to agriculture. Um, so those are all the things we need to recognize. There are reasons why, uh, why this is an awkward, awkward sector, and that's the point from which we begin. Okay, now if we go to the next slide, yeah. The next slide just says what it says. And that is, of course, it's very, very easy to overstate the difficulties, say this is an impossible sector. Um, and I would argue, no, there is very considerable consensus over what needs to be done in general terms for agricultural development. And countries which follow those general lessons almost always see agricultural growth. I, I, I will argue that agricultural growth is rather easy to achieve so long as you take away the obstacles. Now, what's in that consensus? Go to the next slide. The consensus, I would say, is built around two things. Um, one is that we need a rural investment climate which is conducive to investment and innovation. And of course, the moment we say that, um, most of you will be thinking, yes, we know that. We've, we've understood that from the World Bank for several years now. That's much easier said than done for low-income countries. I think the practical experience tells us that we do not need perfection. What we need to do is to get rid of the worst failings 
And the biggest single example we can see anywhere in the world is China in 1978-79, when China made some quite small reforms, um, well, small reforms, big reforms, but they only reformed part of what they were dealing with, the move to the household responsibility system, the part libera liberalization with uh, output markets that took place in 1978. That really changed the rural investment climate in China from very bad indeed to merely bad. It wasn't a good investment climate. The result was a runaway train of agricultural growth. Now, of course, China never stopped there. It, it has introduced subsequent reforms, and that has kept the momentum behind it. But that's from Danny Roderick from, from Harvard University talking about general growth, the importance of just cleaning up the worst. Now, you may say China is very special. Let's look at an African example, and our African example, if you click there, is, is, is Ghana. And Ghana in the early 1980s was in a terrible situation with an agriculture that either wasn't growing at all or was actually shrinking at the time, commensurate with an economy that was in dreadful trouble. In 1982-83, reforms were made in Ghana. Again, they weren't momentous reforms, devaluation of the CD, uh, dealing with hyperinflation, reforming the cocoa marketing board. But the results of those changes that took place in the early 1980s was for 25 years, we believe that Ghana's agriculture has grown at the equivalent of about 5% or more a year, which makes, which makes agriculture in Ghana one of the top fastest performing agricultures over that particular period, yes, um, better than many other countries in the world which is to remind ourselves that low-income countries in Africa don't necessarily have to look to Asia to find sources of inspiration and practical things that can be done uh, to change their circumstances. Now, the other side is the investment in rural public goods. And we know from study after study carried out in Asia under the Green Revolution that the returns to rural public goods are very good indeed. Uh, that complicated chart you're looking at there are the returns calculated by IFBRI to India in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s to various things that India invested in over that period. And if you go through it in detail, what it simply says is those items that are the public goods uh, are the ones that have the highest returns, the private goods, the subsidies, and so on, have generally lower returns. And what have we got in the rural public goods box? Well, we've got physical infrastructure, the roads, the power lines, the irrigation, and so on. We've got the investing in people, education, health, water, um, nutrition programs, and we've got the knowledge goods, the agricultural research and extension. Um, governments that invest in those nearly always see a good return for them. Um, the interesting point that you will see in that from a policy point of view is that if you're taking 100 units of budget and you look at that collection of rural public goods, how many of the 100 units are controlled by the Ministry of Agriculture? Probably less than 10%. You know, the big spending is going to be the roads, the education. Research and extension is relatively uh, cheap compared to, 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 to those others. The other good bit of news about that, of course, is that all of those rural public goods are good for the rural non-farm economy and not just agriculture. Yes. Only the research and extension is agriculture specific. So it's a pretty good bet for governments to invest in that. Now, there's the consensus. Now let's look at what we looked at in the rest of the report, which was to say that so much of the rest is a matter of debates and uncertainty. And this is the way that we classified the field out there. Um, we said, you know, there are four clusters of areas on which we legitimately have debates because there are important technical and political questions to answer in these areas. And let's just walk our way through those. There's a bunch which I would say is associated with the big issue of how do we get transitions from largely agrarian societies to societies that become more industrial, uh, more, more manufacturing industry. And the sorts of issues that we've looked in there are the scale of farming, and 
what is an optimum scale of farming? Should we still have uh, farming sectors dominated by smallholders? Are larger scale units or even large scale commercial farms the future of agriculture? Legitimate debate goes on about that. Land tenure, you know, what forms of land tenure encourage investment, innovation? Uh, do we need formal land titling? Can we go to simpler forms of registration? Is it possible to make progress with traditional and collective tenure forms? And of course, the big debates over agricultural technology um, with the big standoff uh, that we sometimes get between those who recommend uh, um, uh, agroecological approaches at one end of the spectrum and those who say uh, we can do almost everything we need to do with biotechnology, perhaps genetically modified organisms. So for very good reasons, we have debates in that area. Then another cluster of issues that we grapple with is the failings of rural markets. Rural markets are not perfect. Most countries have market-based uh, systems. So how can we make those rural markets work so that they're both effective, efficient, and of course, equitable? Um, and the markets we're talking about there are, are above all the markets for fertilizer, seed, and other inputs, and the financial markets, savings, savings vehicles, credit, insurance, remittances, and so on. Um, we're also increasingly, of course, interested in output markets, shocked, of course, that international markets can become unusually unstable, although we can have debates about why we have that amount of instability, but we clearly don't want that amount of instability. And there are policy questions about how we stabilize what can sometimes be unstable uh, output markets. So that's another cluster of areas where there is partial understanding of what the issues are, but my goodness, uh, nobody has yet cracked, for example, how to get a rural financial system that works effectively for the majority of smallholder farmers. Closely associated with that is the next uh, area, which is how do we get effective collective action for competitive value chains? How do we get farmers to, to, to associate in farmer associations, cooperatives, or one-to-one -one with actors in the supply chain so that we've got the levels of trust, predictability, and all of those things that make markets work. Markets are not impersonal things. They're about personal relationships. How do, how do we get markets working uh, with the levels of trust and certainty that we're accustomed to seeing in, in Europe, North America, uh, Japan, and so on? And then last but not least, we have this huge and growing agenda, which is how do we adapt to climate change? How do we help mitigate climate change? Agriculture, of course, can go to zero net emissions. Um, if we can't get zero net emissions in agriculture, I doubt that we can ever hold it to two degrees on this planet. And then what do we do about environmental sustainability? Agriculture can no longer uh, use up biodiversity, convert land, be wasteful in its use of water, and pollute with excessive use of fertilizer and uh, pesticides. So those are the areas which, in the report, we try to summarize the debates and they're uh, more or less to say these are important debates and here are the sorts of things uh, that we need to be thinking about. And one can nicely look each each chapter more or less follows the same structure and give some literature links and one can right jump into these subjects. Yes, yes. Okay, well, when we presented a draft version of this report, that was where we, we ended with the report, uh, apart from you know, summarizing what, what might be needed for a contemporary policy advisor. But of course, our colleagues here in Germany jumped all over us and they said, that's not good enough. Uh, if we know what the lessons are, why don't people apply them? And they took us into this area of, call it policy choice, call it political economy. Now, what do we know about political economy? It's an area that people have been writing about and studying for 30 or 40 years. There are many wonderful works there. There's a lot of recent work on the political economy of agricultural policymaking in Africa, uh, some of it led by my colleagues at uh, SOAS in, in London, big conference in, 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 in Southern Africa this March. And there are all kinds of frameworks. Um, 
long-standing frameworks. Robert Bates has a framework. Buchanan and Public Choice has a framework. Uh, Fonda Valley and his neo-patrimonialism and so on. You can find any number of, of, of interesting frameworks. Uh, Regina Birner has done a very nice job of summarizing some of those in some of her, her writing. And, but what I'd say out of that is the takeaway from this is we don't have a strong theory of political choice. But we do know where political choices come from. And we know the elements that we have to understand in any concrete situation that will help us and um, participate in those debates in ways that are productive without arrogantly stamping over other people's ideas, engaging with people's ideas, understanding where the ideas come from. And those three elements are on that slide there. There's an area of the narrative, the current understandings, the received wisdoms, and the evidence which is being used to inform that. There are, of course, actors and agencies. We need to understand who has power, who has decision, where they're coming from, what their sources of power, their interests are. And there is the business, of course, of sequences and timing and windows of opportunity. There are moments when bigger or smaller changes can be made, and one needs to recognize what those are. So our take on the political choice is we need to have people who understand these elements, are able to monitor them in their, in, in, in their particular cases, and to make uh, interventions as and when applies within context. And that's just about everything that we did on this particular um, piece of work. Yeah, so just to uh, conclude, or to probably uh, get us into a small discussion, hopefully, um, because I would like to end uh, with, a, with the last slide. Thanks to Steve and the team um, for laying the groundwork. Now, for TI that and uh, uh, the German Ministry of Development Corporation, now the question is what now and what's next? So my, my question would be, as the, the, the GI that person working on agricultural policy, is uh, for global donor platform partners and other interested parties in this would be so who else is engaged uh, with uh, in, in similar advisory processes um, who's doing that in, in which countries in which regions what are the hot topics do you agree with the set of topics and, and thematic areas that Steve has presented on the debate and uncertainty and um, what do you think is the political relevance and all the technical importance of these topics um, for, let's say, the national policies and partner countries you or your agencies or your colleagues are engaged in, um, for agriculture development corporation in general, and for your agency in particular. And um, whether you or others would be interested in capacity development or kind of key learning, Steve has already mentioned it within the report. Um, we specify something like five sets of skills. We think a contemporary advisor or people working in that area should be aware of or should have to pay kind of uh, to do justice to the agenda he has laid out. So these five skills, we actually already got some feedback within GIZ from field staff. Uh, we don't feel super fit in this or that aspect. So we see the need for, for some capacity building or learning, coaching, whatever. And last but not least, we would be very interested in forming or coming together and, and linking up with already existing networks or something like a like-minded community of practice. So whoever feels like this is something he or she would like to take up in their organization, um, it would be very nice to receive some feedback. Thanks very much. I won't necessarily get into uh, your questions immediately, Heike. I, I had some questions to throw back at, at Steve first, but I, I mean, I can I can address some of them first. I mean, Canadian development assistance. Um, uh, we fund a lot of uh, agriculture policy development, but it's, I think it's a lot of it is implicit and built into projects. We don't necessarily uh, make the tough decisions on our end as to what type of agriculture policy advice we want to, to fund. It just it gets built into an FPRI project or a World Bank project. Um, so we don't have uh, 
uh, the capacity to really dive into some of these questions and debates. And I think that was that was what really came forward uh, in this presentation. And it got me thinking about what, what more we, we can do to push some of this thinking at the agency. Um, I think I'll start with my last question then on, on that note. Steve, you, you outlined these four sort of clusters of debate. I think it was really well put the way you kind of structured sort of these four major questions. Are you suggesting then, and maybe it's also a question to Heike about how how it's being picked up uh, at GIZ, that that we develop a position on these four debates, or is it best for a donor to just fund um, the whole range of possibilities under each of these debates? That's sort of what's going on right now. We have various channels at our agency that are funding. Um, you know, small-scale farming. We have some that's now headed towards large-scale farming. We have some that support, you know, the small NGOs of fifty thousand dollars to to do the the small tech stuff. But then we also have the big tech stuff. And so, in a way, we're quite incoherent with our support because we're funding across the range within these different uh, debates. So, is that something you think that we should be? as donors taking a, a firmer stance on a more concrete policy position um, and, and maybe it's also a question to Heike about how how is GIZ picking up this uh, the conclusions of this report and uh, implementing it in, in your own funding Nikita that's a, that's a great question look when we when we did the report originally we divided our topics into debates and uncertainties now we've we've removed that distinction but if you look at those four clusters there, I would say that one of those clusters, there is quite a strong community of understanding as to what the answers are to the questions on rural transitions, yes? But that is highly contested area, yes? I can tell you what I think the answer to those are. For example, I will tell you, of course, that I think family scale, uh, small scale family farms can be the basis for agricultural development uh, for the immediate future, but in the long run, they won't be there. Yes, I can tell you, you know, that something about technology, uh, what was our other thing we've got there? We've got scale land tenure. I, I will tell you a story about land tenure on my understanding of the evidence. There is a, there is a community of understanding that we have on that. But if we talk, for example, about rural market failures, I would say that in the, in the circles in which I move, uh, in London and Africa, that is an area where we're struggling, yes? We can all look at individual case studies and we can say, uh, this has, has more or less worked here, but not there. But we don't have uh, a very coherent answer to a Minister of Agriculture who says, what should I do to get a, a rural financial system that works for my farmers in this particular country? I would struggle to, to answer the minister on that, yes? And things like the environment, and again, you know, we have all kinds of uh, suggestions about where it may go, but there isn't necessarily a strong position. So what we were doing with GIZ, of course, wasn't to resolve these things. It was merely to set out the agenda and say, if you're going to have policy advisors who can, who can go to a low-income country and you know, do useful work, these are the sorts of debates they need to understand. They don't necessarily need to resolve them, but they need to know that these are the issues. But we're inside of those issues, as I've said, Nikita, I think some of them, there is quite strong positions that some of us would take on the basis of the evidence. On others, we are saying we are terribly uncertain and we really need to do more homework, more studies in order to come to better answers on where we are. And rural financial systems are my classic example of something on which we simply need to understand more about what works. Yeah. Yeah, probably I'll, I'll just um, add to my my classic example, not classic, but the example would be um, out of the debate, for example, the question on should we support input subsidy schemes as, uh, from, from development corporations? Um, it is a very difficult question to answer, and as Steve said, so I've, I've kind of done a small roadshow within GIZ worldwide. Uh, with, we have these type of, we call it sector networks, where all colleagues within one continent working in agriculture and rural development uh, meet once in two years or so. So I try to uh, 
meet with colleagues in Asia, um, in Africa and Central Asia, Eastern Europe um, over the last 18 months or so. And I got a lot of feedback on these topics. And for example, on, on agricultural subsidies, the, the need from our colleagues working in practice on these things is not so much give us an answer to it, but give us more support and understanding and debating. So that is what yeah. exactly what what okay. that we wanted okay. to support people and, and and equip them with the argument and give a bit of the international state of the art. So this report is based on the review of the last twenty of twenty twenty five international published material, internationally published material over the last five, six, seven, eight years. Yes, kind of the yeah. mile, milestone report, and it. The objective was to give a comprehensive overview of the, the type of debate. For GIZ, as an agency, we do struggle with forming a position. And I was um, I was part of that. We were trying to, and we were asked within the agriculture the, uh, division, to put, for example, two pages together on topics like uh, strategic grain reserves. Yeah. Do, do we have a position on this as an agency or not? Do we have project experience? Do we have advisory services on offer for it? Um, the same, for example, on um, uh, yeah. Let's let's leave it. Yeah, also, yeah. a good example: yeah. Like, yeah. grain reserves. I I hear from my African colleagues it is on the agenda very much again. Also, under CADEP framework in in West Africa, even under ECOWAS with the uh, regional grain reserves. Do we actually have anything to say and offer on this? And I don't know whether you have, Steve. But um, so to your question, do we need to form a position? I think ultimately it would be good to also have positions on that. But to get to these positions, I I think we need to equip our staff more with um, getting into the debate because I, I doubt that there's going to be a position that is ubiquitous and, and relevant for everywhere in the world. I doubt it. But people would need to have to apply it anyway in the country context. I don't know. Yeah, no, Heike, I really like that idea of having these, these you know, dozen or so uh, big research questions uh, on agricultural policies. And I think I'd be really interested to, to, to get a hold of that two pages that you uh, you mentioned. Uh, it's something I think we we would like to you know participate with, and it's maybe something we could start a, an ongoing engagement with with a few other donors. Because I think at the field level, uh, I know that a lot of our staff just aren't equipped to. to to develop those types of thinking, and they rely on our HQ and technical staff to, to, to give them advice, and we really don't have much. And that, that was evident really um, a couple of years ago for the G20 on the uh, the regional grain reserve that was proposed by the G20, um, and and it, it created a lot of uh, uh, immediate work for us to try to develop positions and thinking on it. Um, but it would be really interesting to, to have this work stream on the side to just think through and, you know, uh, with, with other donor agencies like GIZ. Um, and I think that kind of goes back to one of your first points on uh, where we have much consensus. You talked about you know, the rural investment climate. And I think this is uh, a really good point because um, one of the big, uh, and also addresses one of Heike's questions about, you know, the political relevance. What we're finding with under the new Alliance for Food Security and Nutrition, um, we were a bit skeptical at first, but I'm now thinking it's actually a really powerful tool bringing donors, private sector, and government together, but getting the government to put forward their policy reforms on paper um, and, and sort of as an as a accountability structure for them to go through with these policy reforms. Because um, one of the questions I had for you, Steve, is you, know, you mentioned about changes to the rural investment climate, but we're still limited for you know, of the two, three, four hundred proposals that come into CETA per year, our development partners are still coming forward and saying, we want to do more. We want to do a bit on livestock. We want to do conservation agriculture. We want to bring uh, more research on aquatic fish, et cetera, et cetera. But there's very few proposals that say, we want to do less, or we want to just tweak the system or tweak the policies. So I, I, I and, and the proposals do come forward and say, we don't want to add anything new to the system. We just want to take that system analyze it and change the various regulations. And I think that addresses some of that rural investment climate that you're looking at. Um, so I'm struggling with, uh, you know, what 
what are the projects that are coming forward and not proposing anything new? And that's where I think this new alliance for food security uh, brings something new because you're forcing the government to do policy reforms on land tenure, on agricultural subsidies, um, and address some of these debate issues that you've, you've identified. Um, and so perhaps to Heike, I'd be curious as to um, know a bit when Germany's negotiating the country cooperation frameworks for the new alliance. Um, I don't quite have a good sense either how we are uh, helping the government identify what policy reforms to put forward in the new alliance country cooperation frameworks. There's obviously a decision there on what agriculture policies, but um, I think we could do a better job of supporting our colleagues in the field when they're negotiating and deciding which ones are critical. Um, I'm not sure there's a question there, but <laughs> um, but I think one more quick question. It was to do with your second element of consensus on the investment in rural public goods. We're obviously going down a path now ourselves, but many other donors of, of um, direct or indirect support to the private sector. And I think that goes down towards your away from public goods and more about helping private goods, whether it's subsidies or, or um, uh, risk insurance or other types of products that help individual uh, private sector companies. So I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this and uh, um, how, what kind of advice do you have to, to, to sort of counter that narrative, that direction? When we, when we talk about things like rural investment climates, I would say that in many countries in contemporary Africa, the rural investment climate may not be perfect, but it's probably no longer the obstacle that it probably was 20 years ago, yes? So the, there are probably a lot of situations where not, the, the, there isn't necessarily a great deal of need for uh, big reforms. At the margin, there's probably things to be done, uh, smaller things. Uh, uh, to be effective. I think the bigger concern that I have with the rural investment climate is the danger, of course, of countries that have got a good inve rural investment climate, and then a narrative comes in that says we need, for example, to control traders. Traders are all of them leeches and exploitative, and we need to control this or we need to control the other. And you can start slipping away from a moderately encouraging rural investment climate to one that might become, inadvertently of course, no, nobody want, ever wants to do this, which actually becomes rather restrictive, rather repressive of, of, of investment and innovation. So in many cases, it's not a question of, of changing things for the better, but of avoiding uh, somehow sliding uh, towards what we had 20 odd years ago, when African agricultural growth rates were much less, for some fairly fundamental reasons. The rural public goods, I would say, on those, on those things, uh, the danger for me there is that because these are not necessarily seen as dynamic, innovative, exciting things to do, I mean, maintaining rural, rural access roads is, is not necessarily seen by a new donor or, or or a donor thinking you as being, oh great, we're, we're going to change everybody's lives on this, of undervaluing the enormous contribution we know from doing things that we, you know, rural, rural roads, uh, you know, there's nothing new there, is there? It's, it's standard engineering, we know how to do it. And, you know, a lot of the provision of water and so on, at the margin there are technical questions, of course there are, but a lot of this is, is, is fairly well known. And it's, it's encouraging people to take a pride in providing those public services uh, and doing it, you know, doing it as well and effectively and economically um, as, as we can. Now, there is a line of thought in here, which is I have a lot of debates with colleagues in Britain about what do we do for the most marginal of smallholders, yes? Probably those smallholders who can't make a full-time living in agriculture, who increasingly are uh, in the rural non-farm economy if they were to exit from, from poverty. I have a colleague called Bill Vorley at, IA, uh, at the International Institute for Environment and Development, a very good colleague who's worked for years and years on supply chains, and he now says, let's not talk about the corporate social responsibility of the fancy supply chains. 80% of the smallholders we're dealing with are in a world of informality. 
I agree entirely with Bill on this. And then we, when we compare notes, I say, well, Bill, what do we need for the informal sector? And the answer is the informal sector is even more dependent on rural public goods than the formal private sector. Yeah? The formal private sector can raise capital. It can sometimes get round the failings of the public sector. Informal small guys can never get round this. If there isn't a decent school, if there isn't clean water from a public sector, chances are you haven't got that. If the government doesn't repair the roads, informal producers are going to find it very, very difficult to do this. So I find those fundamentals are a fortiori all the more important for the poorer people, the disadvantaged areas, uh, those people who are marginalized. So that's why I find myself insisting more and more on those fundamentals. Once we get subsidies into the, into the system, private goods, we know that those are almost always um, disproportionately taken by people who don't need them. Yeah. Maybe I'll uh, say something to your question on, you mentioned the, the project proposals that are coming in. They, they usually small and, and they do not stress the big question. I think actually it's a, it sounds like you're getting good project proposals because they sound pretty concrete and hands-on. And um, my, uh, my answer to this would be even in smaller value chain projects, like I've also worked uh, in that field in, in Eastern Africa some time ago, um, promoting a dairy value chain can be a small project, but creating this uh, vertical coordination along a value chain can create a momentum for political lobbying. So in fact, I think there's also now some, some project experience in terms of even small projects. If you manage to get the collective action point together, the rural institutions are empowered to, to do their own political lobbying. And the same can actually hold true along a value chain or within a certain area. I mean, lobbying within a constituency for a rural piece of rules or something. Um, it can make a difference here, and it, it would also fall under agricultural policy in, in the wider sense we're talking about it. But the other point you mentioned on the on the, the bigger picture, I'm not an expert uh, when it comes to the new lines to food security framework, but I had the chance to, to get some country experiences from colleagues last week, for example, from our colleague uh, leading the program, agriculture program in Benin, and she was saying that um, the Putting the framework together at national level was a good opportunity for um, various donors engaged in the agriculture sector to have a closer look at the coherence and consistency of the framework and the national budget and the kind of national investment plan and to put these things together. So she said if the process is set up well or if probably the Ministry of Agriculture is advised in that making the process uh, to, to reach um, the new lines framework, open and participatory in, in a way that um, a political dialogue takes place, then such value chain actors or government and private sector people can um, can be moderated in a way that they that that they are heard. And that is something Steve mentioned. It. I mean, there was the draft report, and when we discussed it with a group of of people in December. Apart from the political economy, the, the other big feedback was that it is not only about political topics, it is also about policy processes. It is not only about what to do, but it has a lot to do with how to do it at country level. And there, I think there is a lot one can share and, and, and learn from each other at donor level, at implementation agency level, um, in terms of how to how to guide also partners and, and, and public sector and private sector partners through such um, uh, dialogue processes. I don't know whether you have any experience on that or other agencies present in the Global Donor Platform, but I would love to hear about that. Yeah, there's no um, not particular experience, but it is something I think we, we haven't actually done the scan and talked about it. So I'm sure if we started to talk about it, we'd have some good experiences come out. Um, but nothing right now at the top of my fingertips I can think of. But definitely interesting, worth pursuing. Um, um, I think this this format of the new alliance frameworks is, is, is a particular one that I think we'll we'll try to learn more about. And, and I think it's basically going to expand a bit more. Um, whether we can 
bring that model uh, outside of Africa to other um, donor working groups? Perhaps not, um, but it's definitely something worth exploring, yeah. We're already over our usual time of 45 minutes, so if there are no more questions coming in, I would like to thank Steve and Heike for the presentation and thank Nikita for engaging in the discussion. Thanks very much for your time and your presentation. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Bye. Bye.